Prater felt a strong tug at his tank and felt himself slipping backwards over the sand. He realized he was being pulled backward on his knees by a current, his knees leaving twin furrows in the loose sand. He reached for a coral head with a gloved hand. The tug against his tank was uncontrollably strong. There was something wrong. Prater could feel no current, no pressure of turbulent water. The sea fans around him were standing straight up. The sand was not roiling as when the ship's engines were blasting the bottom. There was only the tug at his tank straps. Prater glanced toward Samantha and Robert. They were kneeling on the sand. Robert was holding his hands to his ears, but neither Sam nor Robert seemed to be affected by the current. It's funneling somehow only in this area, Prater thought. Prater reached for his weight belt, unbuckling it. He let it drop to the bottom. He tried pushing off the bottom, but got only a bounce before he was dragged backwards again. Robert spun around, trying to locate the source of the sound when he caught a glimpse of Prater, who was now hanging on to a coral outcropping with both hands, as though he were holding on in a stiff current. Prater gripped the rock, and through his mask, Robert could see his eyes wide with fear. Prater realized there was no use in fighting the current, maybe like with a riptide. The best thing would be to go with it until it weakens farther on. He let go of the coral head. The noise increased, and Robert doubled over, shutting his eyes instinctively. When he opened them, he saw Prater had lost his grip on the coral and was being carried across the bottom by a current. Robert watched helplessly as the current dragged Prater like a rag doll over the bottom and across coral heads. Prater grappled for a handhold. Robert saw his regulator get knocked out of his mouth. Prater caught another coral head and clung to it, bubbles trailing out of his nose and mouth. His regulator streamed behind him on the air hose, free-flowing a column of air bubbles. Prater knew if he didn't get the regulator back in his mouth, he would drown. He would pass out and be dragged to the ledge, which was only a few yards away. Prater made a grab for the regulator. He groped blindly for it, found it, brought it to his mouth, and inhaled. Robert kicked toward Prater, propelling himself as fast as his fins would carry him. He reached Prater and clamped a hand over his wrist, holding him against the current. Prater locked eyes with Robert. Robert was about to reach for the strap on the tank when Prater's hand slipped out of the glove. As Prater was pulled away, Robert saw in his eyes an astonished, confused look. Prater was tumbling now, end over end. As he went over the ledge, Prater could see the blue water above, and as he rolled, the black of the drop-off below him. He tried to kick against the current, but it was futile. His legs ached and cramped. His ears started to hurt as the pressure increased. Two hundred feet, he thought, from the color of the water, now a deeper midnight blue. Prater heard the sound in his head and at the same instant felt the piercing pain that could only mean his eardrums had crushed. He fought to breathe as the pressure increased, but could only manage short gasps. He knew the water pressure was keeping his lungs from expanding. His diaphragm was heaving. His vision was tunneling. He had a few seconds before he would black out. Prater looked above as the last light from the surface shimmered down, or was it his vision clouding over? As he tumbled and sank, all he could see below him was an eerie, pulsing, pale blue light. It's beautiful, he thought. It's so beautiful. Then everything turned black.